उसको आते आते उसको भी ले आना काम को हो गया स्टार्ट कीजिए मैं स्टार्ट दीप्ति गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आई डॉक्टर दीप्ति जैन ठाकरे वेलकम ऑल द रिस्पेक्टेड डिग्नेटरीज एंथ्यूजियास्टिक पार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड एमिनेंट स्कॉलर्स camera start kijiye up present on the 7th day of the national online certificate course on shakespearean studies which is being conducted by shakespeare society of central india in collaboration with ispil india and vidarbha forum during the last 6 days we talked about shakespeare as a dramatist dealing with the nuances in his tragedies and comedies characteristics of his villains and female characters we also saw what makes his historical and roman plays outstanding and even the relevance of his plays in the 21st century but one important aspect of shakespeare still remains to be tapped that is shakespeare as a composer of sonnet shakespeare we all, all know has composed 154 love sonnets which are possibly the most beautifully ever written in english language to discuss about shakespeare's sonnet Today we have with us yet another erudite speaker, Dr. Manjushri Sardesh Pandey, who is a well-known uh, personality in the language and translation studies circle. Now let me tell you something about Dr. Manjushri Sardesh Pandey. She has uh, several degrees: M.A., B.A., L.L.B., and Ph.D. She is head of department English and IQAC coordinator at R.S. Munle Dharampet. Arts and Commerce College, Nagpur. She has teaching experience of twenty-five years, twenty-nine years. Sorry, this multi-talented personality is a poet, writer, editor, translator, and a teacher trainer. A poem, "Man Fears Man," was prescribed for Standard Tenth State Board Personality Development. Her poems have been published in newspapers and anthologies. She is a PhD supervisor too. Ma'am has numerous national and international papers to her credit. She has had the honor of receiving the Best Paper Presentation Award for her paper on communicative approach. She has translated Sri Ranga Hari's book Dharma and Culture, which has been well received. Ma'am has been into teachers training since 1999, along with being the coordinator and resource person for the in-service teacher training program for junior college teachers for nearly 10 years. She is invited as resource person for refresher and oriented courses organized by Nagpur at uh, at Nagpur University. This is not all. Ma'am has been an instrument in designing the textbook from KG level to PG level. Ma'am has many feathers on her cap, which includes two regional English language office, like that is Relo USA E Teachers Scholarships. She has completed a UGC sponsored minor research project. Ma'am occupies some important positions, like she is chairman. English language committee textbook bureau Bal Bharati Maharashtra state and she is member of board of studies of RTM Nagpur University Brinhanu Bai College of Commerce Pune Kavi Kulguru Kalidas Sanskrit University Ramte she is the vice president of Vidya Bharati higher education new delhi also so friends today we have with us dr manjushri sir desh pande who will be delivering her lecture on shakespearean sonnet over to you manjushri ma'am hello a very good evening to everyone at the outset i would like to congratulate the IS, uh, isp ll team it is the isp, uh, isp ell team yeah and uh, comprising of jyoti patil ma'am and uh, ghansham sir and they are doing a wonderful job actually every um, every other day i see so many literary activities being conducted by ispel and i'm really uh, like i wonder how do they manage all these things but we are benefited by all these things so thank you ma'am thank you very much then i am thankful to uh, the Vidarbha Forum of ISPL and the backbone, the spinal cord, Dr. Usha Sakure. She, yes, it is due to her efforts that uh, we have, we see that 
this uh, certificate program it has evoked a very good response and congratulate uh, congratulations usha ma'am and uh, yes uh, i have been associated with the uh, click and shakespeare society so uh, pranoti ma'am is also there a motivating factor and due to her we are uh, being able to do so come up with so many things so with this and i would like to thank all the whole organizing team here yes for giving me this opportunity to conduct this session on uh, shakespearean sonnets yes on you i was not able to um, listen to all the uh, lectures uh, but i heard some of them on youtube and uh, yes um, chanur ma'am ma'am so i heard then um, supant bhattacharya sir i heard and you know uh, shakespeare everybody knows shakespeare's plays yes we are all familiar with all his plays tragedies comedies all the you know and uh, we are familiar with all the characters and uh, all the resource persons have done a fantastic job they've talked about the villains they've talked about characters relevance of characters yes uh, in today's uh, world in today's scenario yes and we enjoyed all these uh, really all the sessions were very interesting today we are going to talk about love yes so are you all get up because you know uh, it's uh, very important to talk about love the whole world needs love in the right sense you know yes we talk of love that is what we are going to see how love was in the uh, according to petrarch how was how it was in those days how it how love was in the 13th and 14th century and how love is today how it was in shakespeare's time and how uh, we are going to see love in today's scenario okay now you know uh, when i talk of sonnets before i start my presentation or i can just uh, share my screen and go ahead wait and because that is going to be a hitch for me just a moment Are you able to see my screen, uh, Deepthi Ma'am? Yes, yes. Okay. So today we are going to study Shakespearean sonnets. So we are going to talk about love. So, yes. Now, let us first see what does a sonnet mean. What is a sonnet? Okay. So what is a sonnet? You must have taught. There are teachers here. There are students here. Students must have studied sonnets in their lower classes also. teachers must have taught sonnet you all know what a sonnet is but let us uh, look at the history of sonnet let us see what a sonnet is because we are going to deal with sonnet in detail so sonnet basically is, comes from sonetto it is an italian word sonetto a little sound or song it is it has this italian origin the word sonetto is an italian word a little sound or song you know so sonnet is going to be a lyric it is going to be you will see that it is a it is a small poem so it's a little sound you know when you talk of you know when you are talking of sound so it is a it is, it is going to be a beautiful sound when you are when you are talking about a song it is going to be melodious and when you talk about melody it it requires alliteration it requires rhyming words you know to make it so yes melodious so that's why we are going to talk about sound we are going to talk about song and uh, as far as the structure goes you know so the sonnet yes it comprises there are 14 lines in this and it is a 14 lines poem with a single sentiment yes there are no digressions you know you have just one sentiment here we'll talk of love one aspect of love and we'll move ahead and you'll see how with different different comparisons different different metaphors how the idea progresses that every poet has his or her own skill and the beauty to see how the poem progresses and that is the beauty of the poem it touches you and that sentiment with all its you know the proper words which have been used because poem means words and you know words make all the difference the tone me uh, makes all the difference isn't it so the right word the right tone 
and the meter everything should be in the right proportion to make it very very beautiful okay so this is going to be a 14 line poem so sonnet is a 14 line poem very very melodious okay i it is i in iambic pentameter iambic pentameter i am what is an i am i am is a metrical foot okay and what is a metrical foot you know it it comprises of an unstressed syllable and a stressed syllable okay uh, so it is and it pentameter so when you are talking about meter it is stressed and un unstressed syllable combination it is uh, and when you talk of pentameter so there are five meters here so one stressed one unstressed that is one meter in this way there are 10 syllables and five meters i have shown you how it is a pentameter how a pentameter goes penta means five okay so you know as in hindi or marathi or in any song you know we have we say theka rhythm in english in every song song cannot go out of proportion you know uh, even if it is a free verse even if it is a blank verse you know anything cannot go out of proportion you know when something goes out of proportion it is not in harmony and therefore it needs to be in proportion therefore it is balanced hum jo taal bolte hain gaane mein jo taal hota hai isn't it jo bandish hoti hai bandish kyu bolte hai wo bandhi hui hoti hai it is a bandish okay so therefore i am big pent all these uh, sonnets you will see they are in i am big pentameter i'll come to modern sonnets which have maybe which have a different meter nowadays people have come up with different uh, rhymes different types of rhymes and different meters also but we will talk about the model um, sonnets that are those are the english sonnets and the petrarchan sonnets we'll be focusing on those first okay so iambic pentameter so sonnet is a poem which is of 14 lines and it it has it is an iambic pentameter okay here for example i have given one line so long as men can breathe or eyes can see so how can ye theka kaise dekhenge ye taal kaisa denge hum see so where first it is a cross so it is an unstressed syllable so it is so long as men can breathe or eyes can see hai na this is the way you know this is how it is done otherwise what happens you know it goes haywire and this is uh, it is a it is you know balanced it is because you know the uh, all the lines if they are in proper meter they are balanced so this is we should ek thoda there uh, you cannot extend any word you cannot elongate any line why you know it will go out of rhythm it will be out of proportion so this is called iambic pentameter you can see the five stressed lines you can see the uh, lines over there yes the slanting lines those are the um, stressed those are the syllables those are the words on which the, you can see the stress and cross means it is an unstressed syllable so okay so that is so long as men can breathe or eyes can see this is how it goes now in the sonnet in the sonnet you will see that there are four sections okay four sections means first of all there is these 14 lines are divided into two that is an octave and a sestate first you have to understand this octave it, octave means how many lines eight lines and sestate six lines now these eight lines are again divided into two quatrains quatrain is four lines four lines stanza is called a quatrain so we have two quatrains and that comprises or that makes an octave and then we have a sestate which has six lines now so usually now when you talk about a sonnet you'll talk about an octave and a sestate why because this, this is a special arrangement in an octave you will always find that there is a problem there is some argument or uh, there is some tension and in the sestate you will see that the problem gets solved the tension is resolved or if you know you'll get answers to your questions in the sestate so this is how the arrangement was when Petrarch started, uh, when Petrarch wrote his sonnets, okay? So octave and a sestate. Now I told you how uh, there are four sections. The four sections, in octave there are two uh, sections and in sestate there are two sec uh, sections. Then there is a strict rhyme scheme. If you are, if you see a Petrarchan sonnet, it follows, it has a 
rhyme scheme. We are going to see all those rhyme schemes now. How uh, we follow a strict rhyme scheme. So every, whether it is a Petrarchan sonnet, whether it is uh, a Shakespearean sonnet, you, you will see that they follow a strict rhyme scheme. Then you come to, then there is a volta. Okay, what is a volta now? Volta is the turning point. I told you that there is, in the octave, there is a problem. But when you come to the solution, there has to be a change. So then the sestet starts. So there is a volta. Volta means there is a change in thought. There is a twist. Okay. So this is volta. So all these things are essential. If you want to see whether a particular poem is a sonnet, these are the things which you need to see. What are the things? First of all, it should be in, uh, there should be 14 lines. It should be in iambic pentameter. And then there should be uh, an octave and a sestet. There should be a problem, a solution, or maybe uh, not a solution, maybe it is uh, summarizing, it is an epigram, it is, you know, uh, so that is the end of the sonnet. That is the highlight of the sonnet. That is the most important part of the sonnet. Maybe it, um, it gives you a solution. It, uh, you know, so we'll uh, see some uh, examples also so that it becomes clear. Now, how many types of sonnets are there? Actually, now there are so many types of sonnets, you know. But the Petrarchan sonnet was the, the first one. And why it is called a Petrarchan sonnet? We'll talk about it. So the first sonnet is the Petrarchan sonnet, yes. And then came the Shakespearean sonnet. So these are the, they form the models of the sonnet. So now all the other sonnets after uh, these, they have been formed, they have come from all uh, from the from these Pet, either Petrarchan or Shakespearean sonnets. So uh, the other sonnets are Spenserian sonnets, then we have a Miltonic uh, sonnet, then we have Terza Rima, we have Kirtle sonnet in Pied Piper in uh, Hopkin, uh, Hopkins poems, uh, mostly Hopkins poems, Hopkins uses Kirtle sonnet, then we have modern sonnets, so, you know. So uh, these are the different different types of sonnets. We are going to concentrate here on Shakespearean sonnet. But you know, how did Shakespearean sonnet come? Uh, how did it come from? And uh, how did it get its structure? So we need to understand a little bit of the Petrarchan sonnet, and then we'll move on to the Shakespearean sonnet. Okay. So uh, and uh, before I move on to the Petrarchan sonnet, let us see the rhyme schemes because you know. We talked about strict rhyme schemes in all the sonnets. So in Petrarchan sonnet, now you must have uh, studied poems, you know rhyme scheme, I hope. So Petrarchan sonnets have this rhyme scheme. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. This forms the octave. And in this estate, it is C, D, E, C, D, E, or it can be C, D, C, D, C, D. So sestate, there is a change many a times there is. A change in the sestate. This can be the uh, scheme, rhyme scheme in the sestate. Now, when you talk of Shakespearean sonnet, the rhyme scheme is A B A B C D C D E F E F G G. Now, now see the difference. You know, when you are talking of Petrarchan sonnets, the moment you see so many A's and so many B's, that itself shows that it is a rhyme-rich language because you know. Uh, when the sonnet was uh, invented, when the sonnet was formed for the first time, you know, uh, uh, every language has its own beauty. Every language has its own uh, structure. Uh, the, uh, what do you say, the vocabulary and the, uh, the number of words for a particular sense can be so many, isn't it? So uh, the uh, vocabulary varies, the tone and everything varies. So, you know, the Italian language is said to be rhyme-rich sonnet, and there are many words, maybe, and therefore Petrarch used. So you need, if you need uh, rhyming words, there. Are, if you need rhyming words, if there are four A's, that means you need four rhyming words, isn't it? If there are four B's, means you need four rhyming words. So it is a rhyme-rich sonnet also. Then Shakespearean sonnet, you see, every quatrain has a different. See, uh, in the first quadrant, you have A, B, E, B. The first, the rhyme scheme of the first uh, uh, quadrant is A, B, A, B. Then you move on to the next quadrant. It is C, D, C, D. So that means the idea, see, the sentiment, the emotion is the same. But means, for example, if you're talking of love, 
in the first hand side is compared to something in the second it is compared to something else and in the third quadrant it is compared to something else but the but the essence but the emotion you are talking of is love so that is the same but you are dealing it from different different angles so in the first quadrant you are dealing it in a different angle in the second you are dealing it from a different angle and in the third you are dealing it from a different angle and then the g g is very important the couplet it is very important you know so shakespearean sonnet has three quatrains and one couplet so this couplet it summarizes it gives you the solution it is an epigram so that is the most important thing of the whole sonnet it gives you the gist it gives you the solution it gives you the uh, twist and it gives you the uh, what you say the punch it is a punch line you can say okay now spenserian sonnet now come to spenserian sonnet uh, though it is it might seem mechanical but when we do the poems you will understand now spenserian sonnet it is like when you see it is like shakespearean sonnet will be see a b a b b c b c c d c d and e e that means here also you have three quatrains and one couplet in petrarchan sonnet you had two quatrains and then in the sestet you have you had three lines only you did not have a you did not have a four line stanza but the six lines were divided into three three okay so they were tercets you have two tercets but shakespearean sonnet and spenserian sonnets they are similar but what is the difference see here a b a b and now it is not c d c d it is b c b c that means the idea it goes over in the next stanza also so it is interlocked so this rhyme scheme is interlocked so one stanza it is not um, separate it is it doesn't have a very separate idea they are interlocked so a b a b b c b c c d c d e e then in miltonic sonnet see again it miltonic sonnet is like petrarchan sonnet see the rhyme scheme is same a b b a a b b a c d so you know after this you will find that the other sonnets they are like the the models they are like either petrarchan sonnets or they are either uh, like the shakespearean sonnet but the difference is in the petrarchan sonnet in the shakespearean sonnet in the spenserian sonnet the theme is mostly love everything revolving around love we'll talk about the themes also in detail but this is mostly about love but you see in miltonic sonnet that um, i have written that they the miltonic sonnets they revolve around faith that is religion political matters social matters you know so you know now the sonnet has changed okay now the content the, uh, the maybe now they don't talk about love here so this but the sonnet the structure is the same but now it is not about love but now <clears throat> many other Uh, issues many other things have also been considered in the sonnet now uh, we'll go uh, fast because uh, we are not going to talk much on these terza rima again the terza rima tells you that this is also a 14 line poem it's a sonnet but it has three lines okay it's not quatrain the rattus is so three three lines and then there are four tercets and the, then there is one uh, couplet and that couplet is a a so it it echoes with the first rhyme of the poem so this is a speciality of the terza rima then you talk about the kirtle sonnet kirtle kirtle you the name itself tells you that yes uh, it will be curtailed it will be shortened so this kirtle sonnet it has 11 lines okay uh, like how in pied beauty the last line says praise him so that praise him praise god praise him that talks about the whole poem that gives you the gist of the poems so that is a very important at the last line is very important but here in kirtle sonnet you don't have the iambic pentameter here you have sprung rhythm here you have four stressed syllables so you know uh, she, uh, slowly there is a change okay kirtle sonnet is different okay but and the modern sonnets now are again going to be very very different but we are going to concentrate on petrarchan sonnet and spenserian sonnet okay now just look at the uh before we move on to this uh you know even when you uh, listen to the hindi songs you realize that things have changed hai na in the olden times we uh, we used to listen to chaudhvi ka chand ho ya fata isn't it 
such beautiful you maybe you might have felt what a beautiful comparison kisi ke beauty ke liye kya kya kaha ja sakta hai oh my god isn't it then uh, you came to chehra hai ya chand khila hai isn't it chehra hai ya chand khila hai zulf ghaneri sham hai kya सागर जैसी आंखों वाल सागर जैसी आंखों वाल लुक एट द कंपैरिजन यू नो सो थिंग्स हैव चेंज्ड व्हाट नाउ यू लुक एट द सॉन्ग्स लुक एट द कंपैरिजंस एंड हाउ यू आर कंपेयरिंग नाउ हाउ यू आर कंपेयरिंग द ब्यूटी द आइडिया ऑफ ब्यूटी हैज चेंज्ड द आइडियाज ऑफ लव हैव चेंज्ड सो डेफिनेटली सो द सोनेट्स आल्सो द कंटेंट आल्सो हैज चेंज्ड इजंट इट यस बट नाउ टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू talk we are not going to talk about the recent things we are not going to talk about the recent uh, ideas of love and all we are going to go back to petrarchan sonnets yes so now why it is called petrarchan sonnet actually how did this sonnet come where did this sonnet come from who invented this okay so remember this word gaucomo da lentini so he is a 13th century poet and he was at the court of holy roman emperor frederick the 2 and he is um he we can uh, contribute this uh, to this poet and uh, lentini has developed he has formed he is the inventor he has started he has uh, uh, he has originated he is the person who uh, wrote his poems in Uh, the, in the in the the form the structure of a sonnet he called it a sonnet okay he called it a song and uh, then it was developed and used by francisco petrarch okay and uh, therefore why it is called petrarchan sonnet you know because petrarch used it uh, a lot you know he developed it and he has written nearly 300 actually petrarch has written 366 poems but out of the 366 317 are sonnets so you and they uh, therefore they are called petrarchan sonnets why because he has uh, flourished all the he has uh, what you say used and developed the sonnets and therefore they came to be recognized as petrarchan sonnets okay and uh, now basically the theme in all uh, in the petrarchan sonnets was love and petrarch was in love with laura so his sonnets are in praise of laura okay and many a times in in many sonnets you see that the sonnets are love poems you can say and love is the theme many a times it is they praise their uh, what you say the the object of their uh, here i'm using the word object but uh, the person whom they love it is they worship the person whom they love their lover and uh, many a times it was unrequited love many a times it was unattainable okay so you can see uh, the different ways in which um, people have written praised the beauty praised uh, yes uh, praised the love and uh, they have um, expressed their love in so many beautiful words so we need to read the petrarchan sonnets to understand how they express their love for their beloved okay then structure i told you it is a, an octave and a sestet then this also i told you it is all, there is in the octave there is argument question or tension and volta is the turn in the argument okay it happens after the octave so that that is generally in the ninth line and then you have the sestet which, which gives you the solutions okay rhyme scheme i told you in the petrarchan sonnets already a b b a a b b a followed by c d e c d e okay now let us look at one of the uh, petrarchan sonnets before we move on to the shakespearean sonnets okay so uh, this is now a petrarchan sonnet but it is written by elizabeth browning okay, uh, elizabeth barrett browning and uh, most of the romantic poets even the victorian poets also wrote uh, petrarchan uh, the sonnets in uh, the petrarchan sonnet you can say and followed the petrarchan rhyme scheme and their sonnet is a petrarchan sonnet which they have written so elizabeth barrett browning has written this petrarchan sonnet so uh, browning uh, follows the petrarchan sonnet rhyme scheme and uh, so this is the rhyme scheme which petrarch followed 
and uh, ABBA, A, uh, ABBA, and uh, then CDC, DCD. So this is the rhyme scheme which has been followed by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Now let us have a look. Now in the Romantic period also, Romantic age, the content had changed. Okay, but still this is about love and that's why I have selected this one. Now uh, we'll begin, we'll just see. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. So how do I love thee? So I, she wants to, you know, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning, uh, Elizabeth's father, Barrett Browning, was against their marriage. and uh, But she, without his consent, he was not ready. Actually, his fa uh, her father was not ready. But then she married uh, Robert Browning. And so uh, this is the poem she wrote for him. She says, how do I love thee? How do I love you? Let me count the ways. Let me count the She says, I love you so much. I'll tell you. Let me count the ways. Let me tell you the ways. How I love you. How much I love you. And how I love you. The way I love you. How much I love you. Just let me count the ways. This is the way generally women do. And that's why she says, let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. I love you to the depth and breadth and height. My soul can reach. Now this is, she, she says, I love you so much that my love is not measurable. It is immeasurable. So it is when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. So she says, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. My soul can reach. So, you know, till that, it, I love you so much, so much. I cannot gauge the depth. I cannot uh, tell you the breadth. I cannot measure the height. It is immeasurable. So it's a special uh, metaphor. And uh, he, she says that my soul can reach, you know, even if you are out of sight, I can, my soul can reach wherever you are. My soul can, uh, so it is all spiritual here. She says, I love you so much that even the measure means something which gives, goes out of sight. So it is beyond the measure of that. So she says, even still, even if you go anywhere, even if you are, even, uh, even if you're not seen or even if my, but my soul can reach you. My love is so pure. My love is so intense that it can reach for the ends of being an ideal grace. For the ends of being, what is the end for the beings? The end means what are the goals for the being? That they want immortality or till eternity. So I love you till eternity. I love you till you, ideal grace, that is the oneness. What is the end of any, any living being? What is the ultimate goal for any being to become one with the um, Almighty? So that is the ideal grace. That is the ideal thing. That is the ideal place where everybody wants to reach. So I will love you till there. I will love you this much. Okay? It is not comparable. It is not measurable. Okay. So here she's talking of the spiritual um, way she's, she loves um, which is not tangible, which cannot be measured. But then in the next uh, quatrain, she says, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need. So, so beautiful. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need. You know, if you want to be happy, you cannot say that today I'm happy. Come on, let me uh, collect all my happiness and store it in the closet. No, and or keep it in the, the uh, this thing uh, so that in the in my locker so that I can use whenever I want. No, if you want to be happy, you have to be happy every day. If you want, if you want to shower your love, you have to shower it every day, you, day in and day out, morning and evening. You know, there might be tensions there. And you know, it, live, uh, your normal routine life is also very challenging. Maybe there is uh, nothing special every day. You know, it's a normal routine life. But if you want to be happy, you have to overcome those small, small challenges, those small, small difficulties, you know. So that is called that you are happy. So here, being in love, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need. By sun and candlelight. By sun, that is by day and by night. From morning till night, every day's routine. I love you. I'll, I, I'll uh, see to it that you get everything. 
and I'll make you happy. And that is my love for you. That is to to the level of every day's needs, you know. So you know, you love on you. You you'll say I love you on on some on your birthday, or you can say I love you to your husband on the anniversary. No, or some Mother's Day, Father's Day. No, you have to love your children. You have to love your husband. You have to love your friends, who whomsoever you love. You have to do that every day. That is the challenge in front of you. So that is, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and day candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee freely. See, these are the ways you love. You love. There is no measurement. It is beyond uh, the. Uh, it is immeasurable. Then it is, you know, it is in day-to-day -day things. Then I love thee. She says freely. I love thee freely means what? Nobody is pressurizing. It is her. will it is her consent that she decided to marry robert browning okay so it is i love thee freely okay freely means it is her choice okay as men strive for right as you strive for right it is your right so as people strive for right <coughs> you have your own opinions you have your choice so in this way i love thee freely i love thee purely how purely as they turn from praise so if when people are pure they don't want um to brag about their achievements even uh, they are so pure they will not want just she says i love you purely as they turn from praise as people turn from praise people who are you know uh, people who are really pure they will not want their achievements to be praised so there is purity in their what you say in the will in the desire uh, for which the desire for which uh, the things which they have done and they don't want they have done it with a pure mind so they don't they are not going to brag about their achievement they are, they are very pure at heart they have done whatever their deeds are they have done it with a very pure uh, intention so i love thee purely so now see in this octave now this is an octave okay so here it is in the petrarchan rhyme scheme style so it is a b b a a b b a see so and here in both these what has she talked about i have told you that when it is a b b a a b b a it is in continuation so here in both the stanz stanz in both the quatrains what is she talking about how much she loves so she is comparing and she is telling how much she loves but when you move to the ses state see you can see i have i've written the ses state separately so that you can see the difference now i love thee with the passion but to use in my old griefs now here there is a sudden change here she is talking about the past up till now she was talking about how much does she love when she is writing the poem that is in the present but now she is talking about the past you know we are attached very much to our griefs isn't it you cannot forget your griefs and there is the uh, you know she says i love thee with the passion passion with that uh, intensity put to use in my old griefs you know old grief you cannot forget so in the same way she loves she loves she says i love you so much like how i that intensity the intensity which because you know the grief is also very intense why because the, in, the intensity of the grief tells you that uh, something was very close to her heart and and now something has happened which has because of which she is now in grief so that was very close and so therefore the grief is also very intense so the intensity of the grief can be to can be gauged you know and therefore she says i love you with that intensity with which i am feeling that grief the old grief which i still remember the intensity so the the intensity of love with which i love you is the same the intensity with which i cannot forget my griefs so and with my childhood faiths and again one more thing she is she is saying i love with you with so much intensity the intensity which you can you know feel in the child's faith the child's faith the child will have faith on his father on his mother on god you know and that is innocent very innocent and he will be totally dependent he will be totally uh, he will surrender himself to the father to the to god to his mother isn't it so that is that childhood faith in in love there should be innocence in love there should be total surrender in love there should be total faith so that is and that should be that is compared to the child's faith now i love thee with love i seem to lose now see another way of she says how much i love you i love you with a love i seem to lose with my losing sense so nice 
affect you in uh, maybe in the course of your life you have your own saints you have people whom you in whom you have so much of faith but you know you realize that um, they have uh, you know you have, must have been deceived or maybe um, something has happened and you have lost those the faith on your saints maybe they are your um, there are some uh, good people in your life but now you have realized that they were not good at all something must have happened so maybe lost saints they were saints for you but now they are not saints anymore so you feel the loss that yes they were saints for me they were um, what you say they were my life i used to look look up at look up to them for emotion emotional support for motivation for so many things but now i seem to have lost so you know the the grief which you feel the intensity which you feel when you lose someone who is very dear to you someone who is whom you look up for uh, you know support so you know all those when that is the grief so that is the, the those are the lost saints i love thee with the bread smiles tears of all my life so she says i love thee with my bread i love you with my life with my smiles with my tears so this is see in the first place with the smiles and in the second in the second state she has talked about her tears talked about her grief and she says i love you with all my smiles and tears of my life and if god choose i shall but love thee now these are crucial she says but if god choose i shall but love thee better after that so i am lo i love you here in this uh, world in this uh, this uh, when we are alive then we are mortals but even after the death i'll keep on loving you or maybe i love you better after death so you know we can go on but again i'm in a hurry now shakespearean sonnet now we move on to the shakespearean sonnet now from petrarch you to england in the early 16th century okay in italy it was in the 14th century in the 13th century now we are in the 16th century and he brought it and then henry howard he modified the petrarchan structure so now you know the uh, petrarchan sonnet structure the so petrarchan sonnet structure i told you how it was four and how the english sonnet he converted into three quatrains and a couplet so that was the structure change okay but the theme was again something related to love so the structure is three quatrains and a couplet again the same thing there is conclusion there is amplification refu refutation of the three stanzas whatever argument has gone in the three stanzas in the couplet there is there is going to be the volta there is going to be a complete change okay uh and then the rhyme scheme also i told you ab ab second quarter in a different cd cd third quarter in eff eff and the couplet gg okay so we'll talk about it this with the help of a poem uh sonnet 18 sonnet 18 is a very beautiful poem we'll do it fast uh shall i come now sonnet 18 you know uh, we'll talk about shakespeare's sonnets it is said that uh, after this maybe i'll tell you about shakespeare's sonnets he has written dipti ma'am has already told you that he has written 154 sonnets yes 154 sonnets and uh, actually six more which have been uh, included in some of his plays like romeo juliet and henry 5 and all so there are some six more sonnets which are there in the plays uh, so sonnet 6 now this is sonnet 18 by william shakespeare let us see this now okay now we have seen one sonnet written by browning elizabeth browning and now we'll see the sonnet written by shakespeare now shakespeare says now see the how the love uh, how he expresses his love shall i compare thee to a summer's day so he uh, william shakespeare is saying shall i compare thee to a summer's day so he loves somebody now we'll talk about whom whom does he love yes we'll talk about them after this point so shall i compare thee shall i ca he loves somebody and he's saying Shall I? He is in so much love with that person. So he says, "Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Why summer's day? You know, for this summer winter also. I actually, you know, uh, when we were small, uh, we used to feel that we used to uh, 
think about the summer we have in india isn't it but yes this is an english poem so we have to think about the summers in the uh, in england we have to think about the summer in the western countries so shall i compare thee to a summer's day how is a summer day over there the summer is very beautiful spring is the birth of life summer is the youth you can say all these are we are referring it to the english seasons okay so summer is youth then autumn patjar that is uh, old age and then winter white sheet is lying on nature and that is death so uh, so right now we are talking about summer that is the youth that is uh, the uh, he is praising this young person and uh, young people fall in love yes even the old fall in love but here we are going to talk about the young so shall i compare thee to a summer's day shall i compare you to a you are so beautiful that the beauty the youth that is compared to us because summer in england is very beautiful there are flowers beautiful flowers there is greenery okay people are able to see the sun because there is no sun otherwise there most of the time it is raining it is so cold but here summer they are going they experience the uh, sun and they are it is beautiful so shall i compare therefore we say may therefore may is very important uh, so we, therefore summer is auspicious summer is beautiful summer is youth so shall i compare thee to a summer's day thou art more lovely and more temperate so shall i compare you to a summer's day no no i cannot compare your beauty to a summer you are more beautiful okay you are more beautiful and more temperate you know temperate why because you know there's no harshness temperate means mild okay pleasant that all, all those things come with temperate so you are more lovely and more temperate rough winds do shake the darling buds of may but you know that the summer has a short span because earlier there was spring and now it is going to be followed by autumn so this short span so youth is also for a short time so people the beauty is also short lived so youth is also the it, it is you know and now the rough winds of autumn are going to shake the leaves they are going to make the leaves fall okay so whatever youth uh, you you need to enjoy in whatever things you need to enjoy in the youth make the most of it uh, immortalize the beauty uh, the beauty how to immortalize the beauty uh, we'll be talking about it so rough winds do shake the darling buds of may and summer's leaves have all too short a date summer's leaves summer has got this leaves it is uh, it has come for a short time and it has too short a date it will go away now we autumn will come and so the summer will go away the in the same way the youth the beauty is just for a short time it will go away so sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines so she says so, um, so william shakespeare says uh, sometime too hot the eye of heaven too hot what is the too hot the eye of heaven here it is referred to the uh, referring to the he is referring to the sun sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines the sun shines too hot and often is his gold complexion dimmed and many a times there are clouds so his gold complexion gets dimmed so you uh, so anything can happen so your beauty can go the light of your beauty can be dimmed so it happens maybe because of old age maybe uh, you might meet with an accident maybe your beauty won't remain for a long time due to so many reasons okay so there so it can be dimmed and every fair from fair sometime declines this is very important he said uh, he says every fair from fair sometimes decline whatever is beautiful has to decline it has to uh, it comes down it declines it loses its beauty every fair whatever is beautiful it comes it declines it reduces its beauty it comes down from its fairness so by chance how does it happen it happens by chance or nature's changing course you know nature keeps on changing there is one thing which is constant and that is change yes so by chance nature's changing course untrimmed so that is untrimmed it will change it will happen and so therefore so now here in the this was the octave and now we move on to the sestate now let us look at the sestate but this 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 has happened but now you are getting an answer you are getting a solution okay shall i compare thee you are so beautiful but your beauty is short lived this is what 
the poet is saying in the octave. But now when we come to this estate, let us see. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. But see, all these things might fade. But your eternal summer, your youth shall not fade. Your youth, your beauty will not go. Nor lose possession of that fair thou ownest. Whatever fair, that is your possession. You are not going to lose your beauty. You own it. Your beauty, you own it and you are not going to lose it. Nor shall death brag the wanderest in his shape. Death brags. Death says, oh, once, because why does the death brag? Why? Death brags because everything comes in the uh, clutches of time. Yes. So time, you know, so death, you know, death, time, they will reduce whatever is there. They will reduce it to nothing. So no death. So, but the poet is saying that, yes, your eternal summer, your youth will not fade. Why? And your and death also cannot do anything to you. That will not that will not be able to brag. Okay, uh, when in eternal lines to time thou growest means when in eternal lines. Why? Because I have uh, I have uh, what you say written about your beauty. I have composed these lines in praise of your beauty, and in my art, I am going to preserve your beauty. So with when in eternal lines, so I am going to preserve this in these eternal lines. When in eternal lines, to time thou growest, so time might go, time might grow. You know, everything comes in the clutches of time, but no, my lines, the beauty which I have immortalized in my line, it will not be affected. Your beauty will not be affected. So long as men can breathe, your eyes can see. So now these are the, therefore I have given it. The, them in the red. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life, life to thee. So the, I'm going to make you immortal by lines. This is my love for you. you know? This is my love that I'm going to make uh, your youth, your beauty immortal. And how long it is going to be there? So long as men can breathe. So long as men are there. We say, so here he's saying, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, because only when the poem is written, your eyes will be able to read those lines. So, so long as eyes can see, so long lives thee, till then, this is going to survive, it is going to persist. And this life, and this gives life to thee, and this will give you life. Okay, so these lines, this will give you life. You know, we can go on, we can go on explaining, but again, it's already six o'clock. So these are so beautiful lines, you know. And see, I've showed you how in the octave a comparison is given and what happens in the sustain, uh, in the sestate. You have got a solution how to preserve the beauty, isn't it? Okay. So now we move ahead. There is one more poem and then we'll talk about the themes. Uh, actually, I think I have... Uh, okay. So now uh, we'll talk. We'll just go through these. Uh, this poem, the poem which I read, the sonnet which I read just now, that was in praise of the beloved, isn't it? You felt that how much Shakespeare loves the beloved, isn't it? Now look at sonnet one thirty. It is my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. So my mistress's eyes are nothing. Now see here. Whenever you want to praise somebody, you say, oh, she dazzles like the sun, isn't it? But now, look at these lines. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. They are not like the sun. Coral is far more red than her, red, than her lips. Uh, lips are red. Means what? People say that, yes, she, her lips are red as corals. Okay. So they, they compare the beauty, the redness of the lips to corals. But here he says, no, coral is far more red than her lips. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? Done means dull brown. So he says, OK, now everything, whatever is white, whatever is fair is beautiful. Everyone says, oh, she's so beautiful. She's, she has a white skin. OK, so what is the whitest thing? Snow. So whiteness is compared to snow. So if snow be white, why then her breasts are done? OK, then he says, OK, if, if the, snow, the snow is white. But uh, my lady love, my mistress's uh, skin is dull, it is brown. And if, now look at her hair. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. 
So people might say, oh, if you want to pay, like praise somebody's hair, you will say she has long, silky, flowing hair. But she say her hair, her wires are like her hair is like wire, black wire, black, and that hair is also black, not blonde. Okay, or uh, so he say he. Uh, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I her in her uh, see I in her cheeks. I have seen roses damasked. He said, I have seen beautiful roses. You know, as and people compare the cheeks of the beloved to rose. Her, her cheeks are like roses, rose colored, isn't it? <coughs> but he says, no, no. See, my mistress's uh, cheeks are not. Uh, they are not rosy. They are not. Uh, of uh, red and white, or uh, a combination of the rose color of the roses, and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. And he says that in some per see, perfumes are so you know the fragrance of the perfume. Yes, it is more delightful than her breath. <laughs> when anybody says the beloved like this, but he says than in the breath that from my mistress is reeks. So that means maybe she stinks or. <laughs> there is foul breath, and that is, you know, very natural, very human thing which he's talking about. I love to hear her speak. She says, Okay, I love to hear her speak, but let me tell you, yet, well, I know that music has a far more pleasing sound, but music is far more pleasing than, than her voice. Okay, so do you think she is praising her? I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress. I grant I never saw. A People compare their beloveds to God. Uh, they compare, yes, to their loved ones to the goddess. She's like goddess. She's my angel. But he he says, my mistress, when she walks, spreads on the ground. So when you say when you talk about your angel, angel, when you talk about the love, you say my angel, light-footed, and all those things we say. But he says she walks like any normal person. She treads on the ground. Okay, treading on the ground is also a way to say that. Uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, it is the way you walk. Treading is with heavy foot, or maybe it's not very really light, or there is some problem. Okay, so she walks, she treads on the ground. Okay, and then yet by heaven, I think my love as rare as any. So still, now the crux of the poem is here in these two lines. When he say, and yet by heaven, yes, I promise by the name of God, I think my love as rare as my love is. I love my um, lady love so much. And, it, and my love is as rare, rare as any woman, and she, as any, she belied with false compare. With false compare means what? He says without any false pretensions, and uh, that is, he says, uh, people compare their um, lady loves, and uh, those comparisons are what you say false. Those comparisons are misrepresented. But I have not misrepresented anything. The comparisons, I don't like false comparisons. And I uh, like uh, I don't like exaggeration. So that is what he say. That what does he want? Uh, what does he want to communicate? That he should love the if you are if you love a person, you should love for the uh, for the person he is, for the way he is, for the complexion he has, for the voice he has, for the sound that person has. So you know. So you should love the person as he or she is. So that is what he wants to. Communicate, but it is something. The way it is presented is something different. So I have uh, talked about two poems. Once one we've talked about sonnet 130, and we've talked about sonnet 18. Now you know Shakespeare has written 150 sonnets, out of which, from the sonnet one to number 126, the sonnets have been dedicated to a young, young man. He was the young lord. People have uh, so many. Uh, people have interpreted the sonnets in so many ways, and people say uh, the young lord is some Mr. W. H. because he has dedicated the sonnets to Mr. W. H. So W. H. is William Herbert also. He's the third uh, Earl of uh, Pembroke, Pembroke, and uh, some people say that he is uh, Mr. W. H. is Henry Ryskin. So, and he was the third Earl of Southampton. So. Uh, Though in those times, we, uh, I told you that people had used to write about their patrons also. People used to, and they were patrons of art. They used to, and the people used to write about their patrons, praise them, and they used to get money for that, you know. So uh, all these things used to happen. And uh, Shakespeare has written 
um, in his um, Venus and Adonis and uh, uh, Rape of the Lucrece, he has written about uh, Rice's, uh, Rice Day, and therefore people feel <laughs> that maybe all these poems are dedicated to um, this young man. And uh, because he was young, he was uh, good looking also. Even William Herbert was also good looking. And therefore, uh, they, they feel that he has written. People say that William Wordsworth was a bisexual. People feel that uh, he was attracted towards both the sex. So therefore, uh, the first 26 lines, he has, is all, if you read now Sonnet 18, when you read Sonnet 18, you feel that uh, Shakespeare is, is in so much love with this person. You know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? You are more lovely. So here he's not talking about any lady love. Here he's Sonnet 1 to Sonnet 126 are dedicated to young man, WH. And from 127 to 150, the 28 sonnets till 154. And maybe till 152, he has uh, uh, dedicated those sonnets to a dark lady. It is called the... Uh, it is said that he has dedicated the 28 sonnets to the dark lady. Now, the dark lady was his mistress, and maybe she was uh, uh, basically, she was not a, what you say, uh, this uh, lady that did not reciprocate his love, he did not get his love, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, he is uh, very much in sorrow and he has uh, he is not getting his love and therefore he is uh, right he has written those eight sonnets uh, there is loneliness there is alienation uh, okay and there is uh, you know he talks about lust talks about lust and love in, in the 28 uh, the other 28 sonnets in the first he talks about love time immortality how he can uh, he talks about how he wants to preserve the youth he talks he tells the young uh, young uh, the young person that he should preserve his beauty and how he, he can preserve his beauty by procreation so in the first 18 uh, sonnets he talks about procreation that is the way you can preserve your beauty you can um, you can hand over your beauty or you can uh, give your beauty to your to the coming generation and this is the way you can preserve your beauty so he's talking about procreation in the first 18 sonnets so he's talking about the uh, the going away of time and how uh, how uh, what you say the beauty should be preserved. Then you see that this young man he doesn't reciprocate, or maybe you know this young man. Uh, there are other people also who also write for the patron. So maybe now his attention is diverted to some other poet. So he talks about rival poets also in some of the sonnets and then he doesn't like that he's jealous he's envious so we have some sonnets on envy on jealousy also and then there are some sonnets which talk about the love between the rival poet and the uh, or the young man and the and the lady dark lady so we have these types of romantic loves the theme in the themes when you talk of the themes uh, different types of love. There is the love between the speaker and the young man. Then there is the love between the young man and the um, la dark lady. You know. So these are different different types of loves uh, about uh, whom uh, we see in the different different sonnets. We read in the different different sonnets. Then you know there is he talks about the dangers of lust and love. He differentiates be between lust and love. He uh, Shakespeare mostly you know Petrarchan sonnets were uh, about pure love. About, uh, but here, the, maybe the first uh, 126 sonnets, they talk about platonic love. But, you know, the other sonnets also, they talk about, they have the, uh, what you say, uh, he talks about the sexual desires also. He talks about lust. He says that, yes, um, uh, the love is for physical need also, but one should go beyond the physical need. So he talks about the dangers of lust and love in some of his sonnets. Then he talks about the real beauty. As uh, we've seen in uh, the sonnet 130, that what is the real beauty? Real beauty does uh, is not a real beauty is in the person. So we should appreciate the person. It is not in the color complexion. It is not in the physical this thing. But it is something. Uh, the physical beauty is not skin deep. It is. It should. It is um, the union of two souls. Okay, marriage of two minds. Then time, as we've talked about time, decay, and immortality. In all his poems, he's talking about that time will, 
yes ruin your beauty time will um, take over and then you know uh, everything will decay so he wants to immortalize his love and uh, so there are different different uh, sonnets on different different themes on infidelity there are so many uh, different themes but all uh, something related to love but we've seen how petrarchan sonnets were, were and now we've seen how um, shakespearean sonnets were okay so i think it is 610 and uh, uh, we'll take some questions so that if you want me to go in detail about the themes we can but uh, i think i have told you so much now we can uh, take the questions okay uh, thank you ma'am it was a very wonderful uh, session everything explained so well that actually there's just one question uh, that is from uh, granti vats uh, she yeah. asked how the structure of the shakespeare sonnet affect the contents of the poem does the beauty yeah. contrast with worth now what happens is see when you are talking of love okay maybe in the first stanza i'll compare love to um, beautiful roses in the second i'll compare to waves in the third so you know <clears throat> your the uh, the argument in the different different stanzas it will increase you get three quatrains to give your argument isn't it you get three quatrains but in the petrarchan sonnets you used to get uh, eight lines but here you are getting uh, nearly uh, 12 lines so you get uh, scope for more argument to put forward your point so it is a different type i cannot say which one is better it, each one has its own beauty but you uh, get to deal with the subject and uh, and you get more scope i feel in three quatrains and then you come to your point you have given your arguments and then you come to your point and give that yes if i have see this this is for love and if this is that then you know it cannot be destroyed or it cannot be uh, it cannot fall prey to time or something like that that comes to the end yes okay kranti i hope your question has been answered uh, uh there are no other questions as i uh, told you like i think it was so clear that nobody has any doubts or questions so we'll move on uh, to the formal vote of thanks now uh, now first of all i would like to thank today's speaker dr manjushri sardesh pande ma'am for this very interesting and wonderful discussion on shakespearean sonnet she had lucidly explained what the sonnet is its origin its structure its subject matter everything so well that the students i hope whoever are present over here sonnet this topic is now crystal clear for them and now ma'am has also made us fall in love with shakespeare sonnet all over again by explaining them so well thank you ma'am thank you manjushri ma'am my heartfelt gratitude to the president and founder of shakespeare society of central india dr pranoti chakravarti ma'am who has always been the motivational force for us thanks to dr usha sakure secretary shakespeare society of central india uh, whose brain child was this online lecture series so that the students scholars and the participants from every nook and corner of the country can be benefited from them thank you ma'am thank you so much and of course thanks is also due to dr jyoti patel ma'am president icepel with dharba forum for her constant support and encouragement there is a correction madam even on that other day you mentioned i am president of in india forum not with dharba forum i am okay, president okay, okay. icepel okay yeah. okay okay and uh, this program is being conducted in collaboration okay so i am representing i spell here yeah okay okay okay, okay. <laughs> sorry <laughs> my mistake so president i spell india forum for her constant support and encouragement to make this event successful i'm thankful to the participants for the active involvement and enthusiasm that they have shared with us throughout the lecture series thank you all very much these online programs are impo impossible without the technical support 
so we are grateful to all the technicians involved in the course of the program thank you all for those who were directly and indirectly involved for the successful completion of this lecture series tomorrow at the same time we'll meet for the valedictory function till then good night take care everyone goodbye there is an addition yeah tomorrow at the valedictory we have another special speaker uh, dr murli krishnan who is going to talk about uh, the adaptations a shakespeare cellulite shakespeare so he is going to talk okay. about the contours of uh, yes cellulite shakespeare as well as usha madam will have a kind of a small presentation on the visit of uh, the place of bard so these two are the highlights uh, that's a wonderful presentation usha madam has so these two th no it is <laughs> it is not wonderful uh -huh. only a presentation is there it is a visit to stratford upon even as well as the globe theater Right, right, right. Yeah, Usha, ma'am has been there. So I request so, yes, uh, uh, don't miss it. Right. Uh, as all these sessions were wonderful, the this last session about Shakespeare, the adaptations of Shakespeare, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare, right. Shakespeare, will definitely enchant you and add to your knowledge. So uh, be there right on time tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take thank care. You.